Hello, and welcome to the first episode of The Dark Money Files, in which we shine a light into a murky world. I'm Ray Blake, and with me is my co-host, friend and business partner, Graham Barrow. Hello, Graham. Hi, Ray. First of all, why have we decided to call this podcast The Dark Money Files? Why not The Money Laundering Files or The Financial Crime Files? And it's an important question, Ray. One of the reasons we decided to do these podcasts was to make some of these big financial crime stories accessible to the general public, many of whom have seen stories about money laundering in the papers, or who've watched McMafia or Breaking Bad on TV, and and they'd like to know more. I agree. But why dark money? Well, because we wanted to avoid falling into the sometimes dense jungle of words that surrounds the legal or regulatory Um, definitions of money laundering or tax evasion or bribery and corruption and just come up with a catch-all term that people could quite easily understand. And dark money means all of those things? Well yes for the purpose of this podcast at least it does. So our definition of dark money for this podcast means any assets entering the financial system which come from an uncertain or an unknown source. So if we don't know where it's come from it's dark money? Yeah, I think if we can't prove it's legitimate, we should assume, until shown otherwise, that it isn't legitimate. Okay. Now, you used the term assets just now, Graham, so we're not just talking about money in its literal sense. No, we're not. Dark money has a much better ring to it than dark assets, hence the title. But, But in reality, there are lots of ways to move illicit value through the financial system, and I think we should talk about all of them. What now? Oh, oh no, that would be a bit too much information. But look, we've got lots of ground to cover over the next 13 episodes. And I think the conversation just will naturally include many of those other assets when we talk about some of the very specific laundromats that have come to light over the last 10 years. OK, so you use the word laundromat there, and I'm sure we've all seen lots of references to those um, in the press. We're not talking about the local washer armour, of course, are we? Uh, no, we're not. So, to so like dark money, laundromats just become a really useful shorthand for any scheme designed to clean up dirty money and make it look legal. OK, so before we really get going, um, a quick but important question for you. Why should any of this matter to you, to me or to the people listening? It is an important question and I guess, or I hope at least, most of the people listening are good people who pay their taxes, who got an education, who use the roads, who can access a health service and all those other important public services that their taxes provide. And is that it? Well, no. I mean, I also hope most people would condemn those who, who make money from trafficking other human beings or, or selling them drugs or using child labour to manufacture counterfeit goods. And these all connect to our dark money? Absolutely. How? Because all of these activities are performed for one reason, and that's to generate wealth for the people who perform them. Uh, And a lot of them generate that wealth in cash. But we live in an age where cash is no longer king. You can't easily, or indeed legally, buy a house with a suitcase full of cash these days, or at least not without proving where it came from. So you need to get your dark money into the financial system and make it look clean, so you can spend it on all those lovely things you want to enjoy, but you just can't be bothered to work hard for. You don't sound like you like these people very much. Ray, no, I don't. And let me tell you a story to explain why. Through through my work, I've got to know Oliver Bullo, who writes extensively about the same subject and, by the way, recently published a highly acclaimed book called Moneyland, which is well worth reading. Anyway, Oliver was asked by Global Witness, who campaign against corruption, to front a documentary on corruption in Ukraine. And they featured a story about Nina and Nonna. Uh, now, Nina's a single mum whose daughter Nonna has hemophilia, which, Ray, I'm sure you know this, has um, the ability to stop you from your, or to stop your blood from clotting if you cut yourself. Now, sadly, although Ukraine's health service is free to access, the, the corruption that was, um, and to a degree still is, endemic in Ukraine has has pretty much bled the the budget dry to to such a degree they can't afford to provide the medicines that Nonna needs to control her haemophilia proactively. So they need to treat it reactively. And that means if she cuts herself, they need to buy drugs on the back on the black market, which are which are expensive. So Nina has to protect Nonna as much as she possibly can from cutting herself. So no going out to play with the other kids. And in fact, she has a swing in the hallway of their little apartment. And at bedtime, Nonna sleeps in her mother's arms to stop her falling out of bed at night, which could be fatal. 
And almost, I know in fact, definitely most appallingly of all, Nina has taught herself, even in her sleep, to recognise the smell of blood, something which could save her daughter's life. That's a dreadful story. Yes, it is. And all because, allegedly, some corrupt public official creamed off enough money to buy themselves expensive real estate, often in London. And, and not just that, but when this official discovered that Global Witness and Oliver were making this film about him and Ray, as we know, it's pretty much always a him. Um, They were threatened with a massive lawsuit which could have bankrupted Global Witness, so the film they made has never been shown. And and that's one reason why I don't like these people and I think why understanding the world of dark money is important. Okay, I think we both agree on that. Um, And hopefully the sense that we're getting across in our conversation is that this is a fairly big problem. Do we know how big? Not really. I mean, there are lots of estimates, but that's that's really what they are, estimates. I mean, the generally agreed range is that transnational crime accounts for between 2 and 5% of global GDP. Right. So given that global GDP last year was around $72 trillion, that gives us a figure of somewhere around $2 trillion, um, or currency equivalent, of dark money. Now, that's an awful lot of money. Yeah, you're right. It is. I think. I mean, I think we need to. <coughs> excuse me. I think we need to treat that figure quite carefully. Uh, but most experts think it's somewhere in that region. It might be a bit more. It might be a bit less. Now, nonetheless, that would mean that if I've got a ten pound note in my pocket, around twenty p to fifty p of it was generated through dark money activity. Yeah, I think at a really basic level, that's true. I'm sure if there were uh, economists listing, they'd have all sorts of objections to comparing the money in your pocket to GDP. But I think, as a working assumption, some of the money in your pocket would have arrived into the economy by illegal or illicit means. Yeah, definitely. This isn't a new phenomenon, though, Graham, is it? No, it's been going on for decades, definitely since the days of Al Capone and the legendary Maya Lansky, who was the first major personality in the history of money laundering, and that takes us back to the 1930s at least. But my perception is that the situation has been getting worse. Uh, I mean, is that does that reflect reality, or is it just being reported on more frequently? Well, like a lot of things, I think it's a bit of both, probably. Um, but as we said earlier, the, the inability to use cash has created a much bigger demand for money laundering services. But then so has globalisation and deregulation and emerging economies and the rise of state-level corruption. OK, Graham, I'm going to stop you there because that's quite a lot to get your head round in one go. Let's unpack that a bit and take each one in turn. So first of all, you mentioned money laundering services, which suggests that the criminals or the corrupt don't launder the money themselves. No, Ray, uh, they don't. Uh, and I think, I mean, I think at street level they probably do. So the small time drug dealers and the petty criminals, but the really corrupt, the, the politicians, the bent officials, the organised criminals, they just generate too much money and they need professional money launderers to get it into the system effectively. So that sounds interesting. We're going to talk about that, aren't we? Ray, that's an episode, at least one episode, all to itself. Right. Next, you mentioned globalisation, Graham. Where does globalisation feature in the growth of dark money? Um, It's made it much easier to access the financial system from anywhere in the world. It's made it perfectly normal for legal entities to have a global reach. It's opened up, for example, UK entities to ownership by other people and firms from all, all over the world. Okay, now UK entities. We hear a lot about UK entities being involved in these laundromats. And and by entities, you mean typically uh, an organisation like a company or, or, or a trust or some other structure that isn't an actual person. Yes, and, and thank you. That's really important to, to define what we mean by that. It's so easy to lapse into jargon. Um, yes, uh, it's, a big, it's a big issue and it will have at least one episode all to itself. So moving on, what about deregulation? Well, again, I saw an explosion of access to markets from companies all over the world, accompanied by a really significant increase in the sophistication of the products being offered in those markets. And, and of course, the greater the variety, the greater the number of markets, the greater the number of participants in those markets, just the greater the opportunity for dark money to mix with the clean stuff and escape being noticed. Now, we use the term commingling to explain that process, don't we? We do. So, Ray, do you want to explain what we mean by commingling? Yeah, of course. So, um, commingling is really just a a long word to explain the process of mixing dark money with clean money to make it harder to spot. 
Because if you only put dark money through the system, money that's solely come from corrupt or illegal activity, it, it, it's really easy to identify it. But when you mix it in with business takings or the proceeds of sale of legitimate assets, it confuses the issue. And if you do that two or three times, it can be almost impossible to tell the difference between the dark money and the clean stuff. It's like starting off with a, a big can full of, of clean white paint um, and, and pouring a little bit of red paint into that pot, giving it a stir, pouring a little bit more red in, giving it a stir again. And, and what you then have from a distance looks pretty white. Up close, it, it looks very, very pale pink, but, but there's absolutely no way once that process has happened, that you can separate out the original red paint. It's hidden. Uh, and that's a great analogy, Ray. That's a great explanation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, now, the last thing that you mentioned was uh, emerging economies. And, and, and how does that relate to the problem of getting worse? Well, I mean, sadly, it seems to be an almost inevitable phase that an economy goes through as it starts to, to grow that uh, where a country is starting to move from poverty to a more developed economy, there always seem to be those at the top of the house who would much prefer to profit personally and enjoy a level of wealth that they couldn't have imagined. And if you think about all the major corruption and money laundering scandals, the money does tend to originate from those who govern in emerging economies. And it does tend to end up in developed economies. And to be honest, both sides of that equation are complicit. Okay, Graham. There's another. Uh, there's another episode. Uh, although it won't make for comfortable listening, I don't think. Um, one of the things which uh, is going to emerge from these conversations, I think, is that there's no clear cut boundaries between the good countries and the the bad countries, so called. Um, and even when we look at something, and I think we probably will spend some time looking at Transparency International and their Corruption Perceptions Index, um, which people often think give uh, gives a, a a kind of a seal of approval to certain uh, countries because of low levels of, of perceptions of corruption in that country. Um, it doesn't mean even if you get that seal of approval, that badge, that, that, that you're free from the effects of dark money. Uh, no, and I think Denmark is a really good case in point, isn't it? Well, exactly. And, and, and I know that we're going to be talking about that one at length. Yes, um, we are. Which brings us to the next point we need to cover, which is what are the banks and, and other financial st- institutions um, doing about this? So, now, Ray, you know, I mean, other than obviously making a really important contribution to this podcast, <laughs> um, you, you're also doing a bit of work. So you're currently yeah. the, the acting head of compliance and MLRO money laundering reporting officer for the UK entity of a foreign bank. So... So you're actually there at the front line. Uh What's the view like from there? Uh, Well, if I had to sum it up in a word, I'd I'd probably say expensive. It's costing the banks a lot of money, not just the bank where I'm currently working. Banks all over the world are are, are throwing a lot of resources at the problems of of money laundering and of dark money, Um, especially against the background of continuous negative news about banks and their handling of these things. Um, the reputational hit, following hard on the heels of the, the global financial crisis, which we're still all reeling from, um, isn't doing the bank any favours at all. So what's your view on this, Ray? Are they just trying to do some sort of cosmetic cover-up, or are they serious? Oh, I think they're serious, but, but they're caught between trying to do the right thing and keeping the regulator happy. Um, and those two outcomes don't always converge, Graham. Um, which is something else we'll need to talk about. Okay, uh, this series of podcasts could end up going on forever, right? Well, that'd be a shame, eh? Oh, terrible. (laughs) Um, But, come on, going back to the banks, where's all this money going? Well, it's being spent on a number of things. It's being spent on people, people like me. It's being spent on improving existing systems and designing new systems, uh, particularly ones that use emerging technologies like machine learning and artificial intelligence. There's a there's a lot of that about and uh, and bubbling under. Um, But I think part of the problem is knowing where to spend your money and get the best return from that investment. Um, And often uh, the easiest way uh, is for the bank just, just to offload all of its highest risk customers and say we we don't want to deal with these customers anymore and when we talk about risk in my world we're, we're talking about 
the risk that clients may be using banks to hold or to hide uh, dark money. So when banks de-risk, that means they're getting rid of the clients they think are most likely to give them problems with money laundering. But surely that only gets rid of the risk for that particular bank. It doesn't actually reduce the total risk within the overall financial system, does it? That's a really good point, Graham. Uh, Absolute risk versus relative risk, and that's one of the effects of regulation. Banks are incentivised by the regulators to manage their own relative risk, even when it might be to the detriment of the overall banking or financial system. Oh, that sounds like another episode. Uh, Could be, yeah. Well, look, we've talked a lot about forthcoming episodes. So what message do we need to leave at the end of this one? Well, I think we need to leave everyone listening to uh, want to listen to our future episodes, uh, but also to understand that dark money, money which has uncertain origins, money that may be or almost certainly is gained through criminal or corrupt behaviour, is a, a global problem. It affects all economies. It impacts everyone in some way or the other. Uh, we're waging war against it, uh, and it's a war that currently we're not winning. Yeah, and, and educating as many people as possible as to what it is and how to recognise it and what can be done about it. I mean, that's an important weapon in our armour, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, Graham. OK, well, that appears in however small a way to be our mission with this podcast then. Well, fair enough. Good. Let's start then in episode two by explaining in detail the background to what is currently the biggest dark money scandal yet revealed, the Danske Bank Affair. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to this first episode of The Dark Money Files. We do hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to hear future episodes, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify or your other normal podcast provider to ensure that you get notified just as soon as they're available.